Tomahawks are um, the most popular gaming motherboard MSI has to offer and about the most sold motherboard full stop and it is about one thing and one thing only gaming gaming and well, more gaming who would have thought Today, we are reviewing the MAG Z790 Tomahawk D4, master of compensation, never disappointing tool of infinite gaming pleasure. Torpedo, Tomahawk, I mean, is it me or it's always about small pointy thing exploding shortly after launch? Don't ask me, no idea. MAG is MSI's a gaming budget lineup of motherboard. And most of the money you're going to pay goes directly to a shamelessly overcharged VRM. Everything else on this motherboard is a second class citizen. And coincidentally, it's also MSI best selling motherboard, but with a very dull Z790 chipset, which brings really nothing new to the table. It really does take a little bit more imagination from manufacturers to keep us awake and excited and wanting to buy something new this year. So, starting with the obvious. We're dealing with a six-layered PCB ATX motherboard, which is what you expect for a good PCIe signal isolation and an overall robust product. Nothing bad here. Design-wise, the Tomahawk is milking its darker military theme it has adopted two years ago. It is nice. It shows off the different finish technique MSI has learned since 2020. Very aggressive, very gaming, and most importantly, it's very sober, no embedded RGB, which I tend to agree with because the board aesthetics works great in its more sober form. Instead, we have four RGB connectors, three of which are addressable for a more creative and customizable lighting setup. CPU socket-wise, we have our usual LGA1700 Intel had introduced last year, which will offer support for both 12th and 13th generation of Intel Core processors and bring PCIe 5.0 lanes to our board as well. VRM-wise, well, the Tomahawk does not disappoint. We have what will show to be one of the most powerful CPU powering solution of this year. We have no less than 1,620 amps worth of power organized in a 16 plus 1 plus 1 90 amps phases configuration, 1,440 amps of which are CPU centric. Now that is a lot of amp stock, but uh, the gist of it is that it is one of the most overkill uh, um, VRM configuration you will see in this market segment. It is more than you'll ever need, not only to operate, but to also severely overclock any of Intel 12th and 13th generation of core processors. Cooling wise, Tomahawk didn't change its excellent design we've seen last year, starting with cooling blocks featuring a double contact design, which does allow the blocks to have a direct thermal padded contact with the VRM power stages and chokes for faster and greater heat transfer. The blocks do show a particular focus on providing additional uh, radiating area. We have this enlarged roofing plate on the main block, what they call the extended design, and several deep winglets on the side block. Now, both of these cooling components also show thick foundation walls, which will provide heat storage through any kind of VRM heavy lifting. And obviously the whole resulting in more than satisfactory results. After running an i7-13700K at 5.1 GHz for over an hour, the main block managed to stay around 45 degrees Celsius, which is indeed extremely good. The side block fared rather well, despite a noticeably higher temperatures surpassing easily the 50 degrees Celsius. Now that's obviously the consequence of not having these blocks linked by a copper pipe, which would have spread the heat load equally on both blocks. Overall, the VRM is, well, very powerful and sportive in the sense that it really reacts very quickly to clock changes, but it's also very, very um, similar to what we've seen on its last year iteration, the Z690 Tomahawk. In fact, the only difference we had is that the power stages were 70 amperes instead of 90, but that is already very, very overkill. But it does remain 
undoubtedly one of the most robust overclocker you can find at that price range. So it grades very, very well and should be coupled with higher tier K processors. Now, memory-wise, our Tomahawk board supports up to 128 GB of RAM, organized in a double-channel configuration, clockable up to 5.3 GHz in its DDR4 configuration. Now, being a gaming-focused motherboard, I do like the fact that MSI proposes a more affordable DDR4 variant of this board, since DDR5 RAM, despite bringing more bandwidth and a higher clock, won't affect your gaming experience much. Now, staying in the memory, we have four M.2 solid-state drives, all of which are PCIe 4 compliant, meaning that they can all swap data up to a very fast 64 gigabit per second each. But I'm also saddened not to find a PCIe 5.0 enabled M.2 solid state drive connector as we've seen on AMD X670 powered motherboard and which makes sense because this is the only instance where we can see the real day-to-day -day benefit of having PCIe 5 lanes on a motherboard, definitely something I feel MSI has missed here. But nevertheless, PCIe 4.0 standard is still extremely fast on a storage solution and does translate in sticks getting hot very quickly. And MSI, again, kept what was a great cooling solution on its previous model, showing aesthetically pleasing thick thermopadded plates, which does a great job at keeping our sticks below 40 degrees Celsius at all time and far from the thermal throttling spaghetti monster. Finally, all of our M.2 solid state drives get the scrollless treatment I like so much. Overall, and despite not taking full advantage of the PCIe 5.0 standard, it remains a very uh, a fast and, and agile storage solution since all our sticks can be configured in a 0, 1 or 10 red configuration. SATA-wise, well, we have a surprising 7 SATA plugs, which I've never seen before. There's probably a reason to that. No idea why uh, to have this extra 7 plug, maybe accessibility or anything like that, but you probably know better than me, so please feel free to enlighten me down there in, uh, in the comment section. Now, export-wise, we do have our three export slots, two 16 slots with different speeds, and our bachelor one. As usual, the fastest is the closest to the CPU and provides 16 PCIe 5 lanes, swapping data up to whooping 64 gigabytes per second. Therefore, this is where you want to place your GPU for optimal performances, hence the metallic reinforcement. The other 16 slots runs at four lanes at a fast PCIe 4 standard for a grand total of eight gigabytes per second, meaning it could potentially run a second GPU quite decently. Not that I advise it, but uh, it's there. And there, it's not that I'm disappointed, but I'm going to propose a descending opinion. Um, having PCIe 5.0 on GPU slot serves no one and nothing for several years since we won't have uh, PCIe 5.0 enabled GPUs. For, uh, what I would have liked to see, what I've proposed to MSI is to use those PCIe 5.0 lanes out of the GPU and redirect them on the uh, CPU linked M.2 solid state drive, as I was saying earlier. That gives you a, a, an immediate day to day uh, computing benefit that. Yeah, the GPU slot won't. Now, back IO-wise. First, let me note our rather premium back IO, always a plus. And starting from the left, we have an HDMI and display port for our integrated graphics, a clear CMOS and flash bias button, which is a rather welcome um, troubleshooting upgrade, four USB 3.2 first generation going at five gigabit per second, five USB 3.2 second generation plugs going at 10 gigabit per second, including a type C, one USB 3.2 second generation double channel going at 20 20 gigabit per second, aka USB 4, which I'm very happy to see here. Our standard 2.5 gigabit LAN, our dual band Wi Fi 6E adapter, able to transfer in that cleaner, nicer, better looking, and much faster 6 gigahertz spectrum. And finally, our rather premium ALC 4080 7.1 channel real tech codec, filtered by a healthy 420 worth of microfarads. It is obviously about the best integrated audio codec solution you can have on a motherboard. It, it does great in playback, especially uh, in, in terms of bass, but most importantly for me here, it, it does an amazing recording job, studio grade recording job, which will undoubtedly attract a lot of streamers onto this motherboard. Overall, the back IO is very rich bandwidth wise, lots of features, that's very nice. We do have the noticeable troubleshooting upgrade of having a clear CMOS button, which I do absolutely love. 
chipset wise. Well, let me go straight to the point. The Z790 chipset is very similar to its Z690 predecessor. It is still running at a very low six watts worth of it, which is really good. But the most noticeable difference is that the Z790 chipset runs less PCIe 3.0 lanes to the benefit of more PCIe 4 lanes, going from 40 to 48 gigabyte of PCIe bandwidth. In short, we will have a slightly faster component tree on the Z790 board, if that's a word, but nothing worth you know, applauding or cheering about since the Z690 uh, a chipset already had enough PCIe 4 lanes to cover the most fundamental or performance-centric uh, components on the previous board. So yeah, it really doesn't bring anything new to the plate. Now, front panel connector-wise, we have our usual two USB second generation connectors, great for monitoring purposes, a five gigabit type A front panel connector, and a type C, nothing new here. Cooling-wise, we have eight PWM fan connectors, including one water pump, which is what you need uh, to run any kind of cooling apparatus, going from classic to more intricate custom water cooling solutions. My only regret here is the fact that we do not have hybrid fan connectors which will give so much more enthusiasm and agility to this motherboard and god knows it's already been around us gigabyte is doing it asus is going there so yeah msi if you're listening now troubleshooting wise we do have our first aid easy debugger which is you know really central to know where you are in your booting process and hint you in the right direction in case of trouble but we also have uh, um as we've seen on the back, I use those two extra buttons, the clear CMOS and the, and the flashback, which does bring a, a rather complete troubleshooting solution, which uh, many motherboards in that market segment do not have. Now, in conclusion, the MSI Mag Z790 Tomahawk D4 will cost you about 310 bucks before taxes, which is a $40 premium on its Z690 predecessor. And the question, obviously, as usual is, well, is it worth it? How can I say that nicely? When I reviewed this board, it felt like traveling back in time a year ago when I was reviewing the Z690 Tomahawk D4. Uh, they look the same, uh, they act the same. The only main difference is the VRM. We're going from a 70 amps uh, power stages to 90 amps power stages, which is great. The only issue is the previous 70 amps power stage we can find on the Z690 Tomahawk D4 is already overkill for the 12th and 13th generation of Intel Core processor. So the 90 amps really adds nothing to the equation. I mean, my point is, I feel there is a lack of energy and enthusiasm and, and imagination coming from MSI when the this is board. I feel they just did a copy paste and that really disappoints me. And if you are absolutely eager and pointed to buy this Z790 Tomahawk D4, at least wait for sale. Because the only great thing about this board is, well, the fact that there is a cheaper Z690 version of it.